Well, good morning, good morning, West Coast Word Church. This is the place to be on a Sunday morning, amen? Even if we had to jump that time up an extra spring forth an hour, you did it. You made it. You're in the right place at the right time, amen? Well, if you're here for the first time, definitely want to welcome you again. My name is not Pastor Aaron. For those of y'all that don't know me, I'm uh, Brother Leslie, and I am uh, honored just to be able to fill in for our pastors, Pastor Aaron and Angie Dirksen, who are away, spending some family time with their, their four little ones. And um, just honored just to be able to just be able to minister the word and stand in for them as they are spending quality time with the family. Those of us that have family know that that's always an important thing to do. Invest time with the family. Amen? Amen. I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we will get right into the word. Father, I thank you for another opportunity just to be able to minister your word. I thank you for your word is life. And it is healing to all our flesh. I thank you for the entrance of your word brings us light. So we thank you for light coming forth this morning as your word is ministered. I thank you for as I minister, I minister with boldness, accuracy, integrity, and excellence. I add nothing to it or take nothing from it. I thank you as a result of this, your word will flow freely, unchecked, and unhindered by any demonic force. Thank you for lives being changed. The eyes are here, and the ears and hearts of understanding are in place to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we know here at West Coast Word Church... We hold strong, strong to the word, and we preach faith here. That's just what we do here. That's the DNA of this ministry. We know that our faith is what gets results, and faith works by love. So I'm going to be preaching faith this morning. And if you were here on last Sunday, last Sunday, our pastor opened up a new series, and he entitled it, Simply faith. Simply faith. He came from a passage of scripture in Romans 1 and 16. 1 and 16. And I want to go there so we could take a look at that. When we talk about simple faith. Simple faith. And it reads in this King James Version. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So we've been taught here at West Coast Word Church about this passage of Scripture. It's it's nothing that's new to us. But what Pastor Aaron pointed out last week is that we know that when we see the word gospel, we know the word gospel means good news. It means good news. So there's nothing, um, no calamity, no, nothing fearful about when the good news goes forth. It should be just that when we hear it, good news to our, to our ears. Amen? Amen? Now, he also mentioned that we see that word, that the good news, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation. And one of the meanings of salvation we know is that when we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of our life, then we're in covenant with him and we are saved. We're saved or we're safe. We're safe. That means that we're going to heaven. Amen. We are going to heaven. And just let me stick a pin in it real quick that when we confess that Jesus is Lord, We are going to heaven. Do not let anybody talk you out of that. Amen? Amen. 
Because we know that the devil, who is our enemy, he's our adversary, he would, he's the one that speaks doubt and unbelief, and he's the one that if we miss it, because we all miss it, that he's the one that's going to try and sow condemnation into our lives. But God's word says, once you cut covenant with me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we're going to heaven. Amen. I'll see you there. Amen? Amen. All right. But going a little deeper into that word salvation, Pastor Aaron taught us that it also means a much more deeper, or well, has a, some deeper knowledge to it that's really not taught. But <clears throat> when we study out the scriptures, we see that salvation also means deliverance. It means preservation, protection, it means liberty, it means restoration, it means wholeness, soundness. In that salvation package, and that's what I'd like to call it, a salvation package, it has healing in that package. It has rest, harmony, and peace. So when we talk about salvation, that salvation package, that's really the finished works of Jesus. Everything that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross and when he got up, his works, he said, the works are finished. So everything that Jesus did for us, we have it in this salvation package. We have deliverance. We have preservation. We have healing. We have rest. We've got wholeness. We have peace. And we know what that peace means. That peace means shalom. Nothing is missing or nothing is broken from our lives. That's what Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. But I want to hang out on a word in that salvation package called harmony this morning. Harmony. Say harmony. harmony. Now, going back to what Pastor Aaron talk, talked about, he said simple faith. That was his message, simple faith. faith. He said simple faith is just simply believing God. Simple faith is just simply believing God. And he also said that believing is key to the power happening. Believing is key to the power happening. And I don't know about you, but I'm all about results. Anytime I get involved with something, anytime that I'm going to invest my time in something, I want results. And I know you are the same way as well. We want results. So believing is the key to the power happening or the results happening in our lives. Amen? Amen. So I share this because Again, in the salvation package is that word harmony, harmony. And just a quick definition on harmony. When we talk about harmony, it means to be in agreement, to be in agreement. Or it could also mean the union of different sounds, the union of different sounds, or in essence, having one voice, having one voice. Now, just to give you a practical example of this, any of you all who've ever been to an orchestra performance and prior to them playing the numbers that they are, are, are set up to play or going to play, prior to them playing, they, they do what I think is called tuning. They, do, they, they tune. you got... I think you got the woodwinds, you got the brass, you got the strings, you got all different instruments going on. And prior to them playing the assigned number, they're tuning. And when you hear them tune, you're sitting out there like, wow, that doesn't sound good at all. It just sounds like random arrows going everywhere, random arrows of sound. But when that conductor steps to that podium and he lifts up his baton, then everybody is getting in place and they're getting in what's called one accord and they're ready to play that number. And when he does this thing, 
and they're all playing on that spirit of or that one accord, they are planning what's called harmony. And when we hear the orchestra playing harmony, it goes from random arrows to something that is a beautiful sound. Amen? We listen to our praise team when they're up here together. It's a beautiful sound because they're in harmony. They're in one voice praising God. Amen? So my message title this morning is When Harmony is in Place, the Voice of Love Speaks. I'm going to repeat. When Harmony is in Place, the Voice of Love Speaks. I believe every mighty move of God that has happened or will happen is a direct result of his children simply believing in his word by operating in a spirit of harmony or one accord in the strongest force that there is called love. I'm going to repeat that. Every mighty move of God that has happened or that is going to happen is a direct result of us, God's children, simply believing in his word by operating in a spirit of harmony or one accord in the strongest force that there is called love. We know about love. We know that love never fails. It never fails. We know that the word tells us that God is love and love is God. So if we're walking in harmony, then we're operating under the umbrella of love. If we're walking in a spirit of one accord, then we're operating under the umbrella of love. So in order for that power of God to show up in our lives as the body of Christ, we've got to be saying and believing the same thing. I need to repeat that. We've got to be saying and believing the same thing as the body of Christ. Let's take a look at some word, because this is West Coast Word Church. So I've got a little bit of word I'm going to sow into you this morning. Let's go to Romans 15, Romans 15, 5 and 6. And I want to look at two different translations. I want to look at the New Living, which Tech Team has up. Thank you, Tech Team. And also Amplified in Romans 15, 5 and 6. New Living says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. Then all of you can join together with one voice. Say one voice. voice. Giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Amplified says, Now may the God who gives the power of patient endurance, the steadfastness, and who supplies encouragement, grant you to live in such mutual harmony and such full sympathy with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. And six goes on to say that together you may unanimously with united hearts and one voice praise and glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We know when we send praise up that it steals the enemy. When praise, when we praise God, it steals the, everything, the enemy, and we know that we have an enemy. Okay, we know that. We, we, we know we have an enemy. We've been taught this here. Uh, it's, it's just not some fairy tale. No, we have an enemy because John 10.10 10 tells us that we have a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy from us. But we also know that on, the, on the, the flip side of that, we have a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, but I am come that we might have life and have it more abundantly to the full and overflowing. So praise steals the enemy, and when the enemy is still, that allows the power or the glory of God to show up on the scene. Amen? Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians, 
Some more words, 2 Corinthians 13 and 11. 2 Corinthians 13 and 11, and want to take a look at New Living. 2 Corinthians 13 and 11, New Living. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. And we know anytime you start something and anytime you end something, that's important. That's important. The, fin- the, the beginning and the finishing are something important. So Paul's saying here, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. There it is. Live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love will be with you. Now, talking about Paul... And I want to talk about an event that happened with Paul and Silas in the Bible. And I want to, I'm coming from Acts 16, Acts 16. In this event, Paul and Silas, they were going to different towns preaching the good news. They were preaching the gospel. And they were in the house of prayer, as it was called. And in that house of prayer, there was a demon-possessed woman who was there as the good news was going forth. And this demon-possessed woman was someone, they said, she was a, someone of divination. She had a spirit of divination operating in her. And she was also was called a soothsayer. A soothsayer. And a soothsayer is somebody who's a fortune teller. Somebody who's a fortune teller. And the word tells us that this this woman who was there when the good news was going forth with Paul and Silas, that she kept heckling them. She kept heckling them time after time after time as they were ministering the good news. But the word also tells us that this woman made a lot of money from fortune telling. She made a lot of money from fortune telling. In essence, she was she was supporting the flow of their economy there in that town where Paul and Silas were. So Paul, one day he had enough. He said, I command you to come out of this this woman in the name of Jesus. That spirit that's operating in you, I command you to come out. And spirit came out of her. She She was delivered, set free. But what happened is, as a result of her being set free and the demon being cast out of her, the money wasn't flowing anymore. It was not flowing anymore. She was no longer supporting that town. She was no longer the financier of of, of that town. So they got angry. The men who she was working for, they got angry. They got very angry, and they tried to stir up what's called strife. They stirred up strife against Paul and Silas, and they end up having them arrested. Now, they've been there day after day preaching the good news, But when they started messing with the money, then you saw the real demon come out. You mess with the money, then you saw the real demon come out. So they beat, they stripped, it says, the word says they tore the clothes off of Paul and Silas and beat them real bad. Put them in jail and they put them in stocks and they put them actually in the center of the jail just so... uh, they could have what's called extra watch, so to speak, on them because they were that much of a threat to that area. But something is interesting that I like about this passage of Scripture. If we could go to verse 25, and we're already there. You guys are on it. It says, verse 25 says, around midnight. Say around midnight. midnight. Or at midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises To God, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. 26, and it says suddenly, say suddenly. Suddenly Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner in that prison fell off. So... When we talk about 
Paul and Silas, they prayed and sang songs. They were together in harmony. They were together in a spirit of one accord. They had just gotten bludgeoned, beaten. But yet at midnight, they're singing and giving praise to God in harmony. They're making perfect music to God. And as a result, the power showed up. The power showed up. And when the power showed up, the jailer who was actually assigned to Paul and Silas, he just, he lost it. Well, I can't say he lost it. He found it because he got saved. He got saved. He got set free. And his whole household got saved and set free because of the power, because of the power. And the power was there because, again, the harmony. Paul and Silas, they were in harmony with each other. Now, let's take a look at some more words. Let's go to Philippians 2.2. 2. Philippians 2.2. 2. And this is coming from Amplified. It says, fill up and complete my joy by living in harmony. There's that word. And being of the same mind and in one purpose, having the same love, being in full accord and of one harmonious mind and intention. So when we see this here, our joy, our joy actually gets filled up when we're walking in harmony. And we know that we've got joy on the inside of us because, again, that's part of that fruit of the spirit that's in us. When that's that's part of the fruit of the spirit, that love, joy is in us. So when we walk in harmony, our joy gets full. And God likes it when our joy is full. He likes it so much when our joy is full. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. You guys doing all right out there? Yeah. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, New Living Translation says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So we see this, and what I pull out of this, it's vitally important that we do not allow strife to enter our church body or our homes. Vitally important. Vitally important that we do not allow strife to enter in. We know the word tells us where there is envying and strife, that there's every evil work. And I'm telling you, the two places that the enemy likes to come in is in our house and in our church. But not here at West Coast Word Church and not in our homes. Amen? Amen. First Peter three. Let's go to First Peter three and eight. First Peter three and eight. Amplify. And I see Pete running the video. We got Pete up there on the video too. Thank you, brother Pete. First Peter three and eight it says. Finally, all of you should be of one and the same mind, united in spirit, sympathizing with one another, loving each other as brethren of one household compassionate and courteous, tenderhearted and humble. So let's go to verse 7 and see why it's important that we don't allow strife to enter our homes or our church. Can we go back up to 7? 1 Peter 3 and 7. In the same way you married men should live considerably with your wives, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation, honoring the woman as physically the weaker but realizing that you are joint heirs of the grace. That's important, husbands. We are joint heirs. We're not to dominate. I don't dominate my wife. We work jointly together. When I start trying to dominate my wife, it's a crash and burn for me every time. I might as well just look at the other sofa or the other side of the room. That's not how God ordained it. That's not, we work we, we are to help meet. That's my help meet. Yes. Help meet the needs of, of the common goal or the common purpose. 
So that's just a side note for, for the husbands out there. We don't dominate. No, no, no. And it goes on to say, we are joint heirs of the grace, God's unmerited favor of life, in order that, here it is, this is why we can't let strife come in, in order that our prayers may not be hindered and cut off. Otherwise, we cannot pray effectively. We know how important prayer, our prayer life is with God. That's our communication line. Just like we have communication with our children, our husband, our wives, our family. Prayer is just the same way we communicate with God. So when we allow strife to enter in, it, the word tells us it's cut off or it's hindered. And we can't allow that. I want to read you something from... Gloria Copeland, the wife of Kenneth Copeland, when she's talking about this subject. And it says, or she says, believers agreeing together in the Holy Spirit are an unstoppable, powerful force. She says, that's why Satan fights Christian families. That's why he doesn't want men and women unified in marriage. He wants us fighting and fussing all the time because he knows it will hinder our prayers. Anytime we fail to get results from the prayer of agreement, she says, run a harmony check. Run a harmony check. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you if you're in strife with your wife or someone else. She also said, then follow the instructions in Mark 11.25. Mark 11.25, and we know, and it says, when you stand praying, forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. So that's so important that we walk, we, we, we forgive others when we miss it, and we all miss it. And it's, it's also important to know when we do miss it, that we're not to run from God, but we're to run to God. Because the enemy would come in right away when we miss it. See, I told you, I told you, I told you, 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 you were no good. I told you this. I told, he's, he's coming in right away with, the, with the, the condemnation mallet to just beat us down, just beat us down. But God says when we miss it, hey, let's run to him, ask forgiveness. Our hands are clean. So Gloria Copeland goes on to say, it's not sufficient for you and another person simply to agree on the particular issue you're praying about. She says, you must also be in harmony in the other areas as well. So run that harmony check. Run that harmony check. And again, just ask the Holy Spirit what it is or what areas need to be exposed if there's any strife that is set, set in. Now, when we talk about that prayer of agreement, that prayer of agreement we know is found in Matthew 18, 19. If we could put that up real quick, Matthew 18, 19 is where the prayer of agreement is. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. So that's why it's important when we go to God in prayer, we link up. If, we don't, if we're not married, we link up with another believer. We come together in agreement with another believer. One could put a thousand to flight, but the word also tells us two can put 10,000 to flight. So two believers together are a powerful force because they are in harmony. Amen? Now, remember the day of Pentecost? I want to point out another illustration where the power went forth. The day of Pentecost, and let's go to the book of Acts. Day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on them. Acts chapter 1. Just want to look at that real quick. Acts chapter 1. And coming from the King James Version, Acts chapter 1. I want to look at verses 4 and 5 and then drop down to 8. And being assembled together with them, 
commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Jesus is talking here and he's telling them, he said, wait for the promise of the father, which said, you have heard of me. And verse five says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then verse eight goes on to say, but you shall receive power. There it is, power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. So what caused the Holy Spirit to come? What caused the power to, to happen that day? What caused them to experience the power, the, the moving of the Holy Spirit? Well, <clears throat> if we scoot over to Acts 2 and 1, Acts 2 and 1 says it right here. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So they were all with one accord in one place. They were in harmony. They were in harmony. Now, I want to talk about another example. I got two more. You guys with me? Yes. Okay, I got two more. Um, two more examples of the power showing up. Children of Israel. Children of Israel, after they had been in slavery for 400 years, God said, okay, I've heard your cry unto me. I've heard your cry unto me. I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. I'm going to bring you into a land that I have set aside for you. He's saying, I've got a land that flows with milk and honey, and it's yours to possess. Now, God brought his children out after being in slavery for 400 years, it says he brought them out. And when he brought them out, he brought them out wealthy because it said they stripped the Egyptians of everything that they had. So he didn't bring them out empty handed. He brought them out wealthy. They were loaded down. Now, he changed their diet out in the, out, out in the wilderness when he brought them out of Egypt. The stuff that they were eating in Egypt, they weren't eating when he brought them out of the desert. He changed their diet to manna. Manna. That was their diet. That's what they ate, manna. Day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. So the children of Israel, they got out there and they saw mighty works because in order for them to come out of Egypt, we know that they had to walk through the Red Sea. He parted the Red Sea for them. That's pretty big time, I think. Yeah. You know, uh, they saw his mighty hand at move when he crushed all of the chariots in the Red Sea who had come after them pretty big time. But they got out there and they started murmuring and complaining, murmuring and complaining consistently after one thing after the other. And we know that when there's murmuring and complaining, that means they were sowing strife. They were sowing, sowing strife and there's no harmony going on out there in the camp. So as a result of that, he said, okay, <clears throat> fast forward. Those of you all who are continuing to murmur and complain, those of you all who don't believe that the promised land is for you, you're not going to make it there. You will not make it there. Only Joshua and Caleb are going to make it to the promised land. And everybody who's 20 years old or under, they're going in to possess it. But those of you all who have been operating in strife, not believing my word, not operating in harmony, you're not going over. So we know that as a result of Joshua and Caleb believing in God's word, operating in harmony, that they went in and they possessed the land. They possessed the land. They saw the continuous power of God move and they possessed the land. Amen? All right. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 17, 26 and 28. And I'm rounding third. Acts 17, 26 through 28. And I'm going to come from the New Living Translation. Twenty six says from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall and he determined their boundaries. Twenty seven. 
His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from one of us. 28, for in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. We are his offspring. From one blood, one blood, one blood, God has made many nations. One blood. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10.32. 1 Corinthians 10.32. It's King James Version. It says, Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now let's look at this a little bit deeper. Neither to the Jews, Gentiles, nor the church of Christ. When I see this, I see three different people, three different groups of people. I see the Jews, who we know they're God's covenant people. He, that, that Hebrew line, he said, I'm, I'm going to be to you, God, and you're going to be to me a people. He called them out, the Jews. Then I see the Gentiles. The Gentiles are those persons that don't have a covenant with God. They don't have a covenant with God at all. And then three, I see the church of Christ or the body of Christ, which is us, because we have a covenant with God saying that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are the body of Christ. Are we seeing this? Yes. The Jews, Gentiles, no covenant. Church of God, that's us, the body of Christ. Now, where do I share this? Why am I sharing this? Well, those of you all that, that know me um, know that I, I work in the education field, and God has blessed me to be in that field for quite some time. I give him all the praise and all the glory for it. He's allowed me to sow seed into the lives of young people, which is so very important, and I don't take that lightly. For the last 12 years, he's had me positioned in a high school called Clearwater High School, which those of you all that aren't familiar, because I know we have some Pascoans, Pascoans in here, if, if I'm saying that right. <laughs> Clearwater High School is in the center of Pinellas County from a geographical standpoint. Clearwater High School is probably one of the most diverse schools, has the most diverse uh, student population in our district, by far, by none. Many cultures there at Clearwater High School. And you come there, you look at Clearwater High, it's almost like going over to a Disney World theme park when you see just all the cultures there. Well, that's what you got at Clearwater High. Well, <clears throat> at Clearwater High, I work for a principal and blessed to be under his leadership who is focused on two things. Number one, he allows and gives his students a voice. He gives his students a voice. He allows them to express themselves, allows them to give input into the learning, which is so important. And number two, number two, he believes in what's called experiential learning. Experiential learning, meaning anytime we can get our students outside of the four walls, get them outside of those textbooks, and let them go see it, feel it, touch it, something tangible, then we know a deeper knowledge base is really being sown in their lives. They, they connect the dots, so to speak, when we talk about experiential learning. So I'm sharing all this because five years ago in our country, we were going through a lot of unrest. A lot of unrest. A lot of things were popping up in various different cities in our country. And it was like, man, what is going on here? What's going on? You got this going on over here. You got this going on over there. You got that going on over there. Uh, protests going on in various different cities. But, and we got an election year that was coming up. You could clearly see from the spirit realm that the, the enemy was at work trying to sow strife and division into our country. That's what was going on. 
He was sowing strife and division in our country, and our students are seeing it. They're seeing it. So our principal was like, hey, Mr. Hopkins, if our students, when they leave us, they have to experience this, they have to experience what they're seeing on social media, we've got to be proactive about it, and we've got to deal with it, hit it head on, so when they come on our campus, there's a spirit of harmony and peace. That's what we want on our campus. And he said, how about we come up with a trip that's focus and theme is centered around the civil rights movement? And he said, I want to do this because if our students don't know their history, then they're going to repeat history. He said, if they don't know it, they're going to repeat it. So he said, what I want you to do is come up with a way to find out how we can embark on this and make it happen. And I'm like, OK. Uh, my principal is a pretty outside of the box thinker. And anytime he goes outside of the box, usually I have to go with him. And it means uh, an additional task. But I'm all for it. I'm all for it because it's all about the students. It's all about the students being stretched and exposing them. So we called around and found out that there was nothing really that existed out there where there's a package tour where students can go on a civil rights tour. There are some, a few touches and glimpses out there, but nothing as extensive as he wanted. He wanted them to cover most of the major uh, cities that were involved during that time. Atlanta, Birmingham, Selma, Montgomery, Washington, D.C. So he said, you know what? <clears throat> We're going to flip this to the students. We're going to have them be the tour guides. We're going to have them research the sites that they want to go see in those key civil rights cities. We're going to have them make all the contacts. We're going to have them chart the course. And we'll provide the finances to make sure that they're able to embark on this, on this trip. So <clears throat> I've been on a lot of field trips. And I tell you. The first year that we did this, life-changing for me. I think I learned more than the students. I saw things and saw pieces of history that had been tucked away that I never knew was there. I never saw that in a textbook. I never experienced that. But I had some takeaways from my experience. I had some takeaways from what had happened during the Civil Rights Movement. And one of the takeaways I had was that the Civil Rights Movement was a God movement. It was a God movement. The hand of God was on those key leaders, Martin Luther King, um, John Lewis. You think of um, Fred Shuttlesworth out of Alabama, Birmingham. Many others, C.T. Vivian, <clears throat> our students were able to connect with some persons who were actually involved in the movement. They were what was called foot soldiers, meaning they were the ones that marched. And when we listened to their story, you would find out some things that, again, it just wasn't in the textbook. One of the things, again, that I said I took away from it was it was definitely a God movement because one of the persons we met said, Martin Luther King said, you can get anything done with steady, loving confrontation. Anything. He said, you want to get something done, you can get it done with steady, loving confrontation. And he was all about nonviolence. It was all about nonviolence. And when you listen to his speech, you could hear the word coming out of it. You can hear the word coming out of his speeches. One of, the, one of them, the, the night before he was, I think, assassinated in Memphis, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's called me to preach the gospel to the poor. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So, again, takeaway number one was the civil rights movement. It was a God movement. And then number two, persons who were major contributors in that movement were children. They were children. They were children who were marching and being sent to jail because the persons knew, persons who uh, employed their parents, they, they threatened their parents saying, if you march, 
then you're going to lose your job. So the children had nothing to lose. They were the ones who were marching. They were the ones who were marching for freedom and voting rights. And then number three, and then of course we know out of the mouth of babes, <laughs> out of the mouth of babes, praise is ordained. But number three, my takeaway was that when the body of Christ got together in harmony and said enough was enough, only then did we see results on a monumental scale take place. And only then did justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So the persons who said enough was enough was the body of Christ. They were persons of all different denomination, persons of all different cultures who came together in those towns and joined with the persons and said, hey, we're here with you. God is, is here with you. And when they did that, when they got in harmony with each other, the power showed up. The power showed up. Laws were changed. Results started happening. Now, I want to reflect back to 1 Corinthians 32 as I close. And Matt, you can come on up. Three groups of people, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the body of Christ, the church. When we start looking, first of all, we know that God is an inside-out God. He looks on the heart. He, he always works on us from the inside out, not from the outside in. When we start looking at putting on our lens the way he, he sees it, that we are the body of Christ and we don't look at the outer, we start looking at the inner, we start coming in harmony and doing exactly what he's directing us to do as the body of Christ, then the power is going to show up. We're going to be that mighty moving force to get the job done in whatever it is he's called us to do. Amen? Amen. We're not going to get caught in the strife. We're not going to get caught in the distractions. We're not going to get caught in a division. No, we're going to stay as one, one body, one mind, one spirit, a mighty moving force. Psalms 85 and 10 if we could put that up, Psalms 85 and 10, it says, Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. West Coast Word Church, are we ready for the move of God to take place? Are we ready for the power? Yes. So we're going to let harmony rule and the voice of love speak. And it's going to happen. Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Lord, give God praise. So, if you want that power to take place, if you want to get in on the flow, that harmony flow, that spirit of one accord flow, that body of Christ flow, it's all about a covenant relationship with Christ Jesus. And it's, as the pastor says, it's simple faith. Simple faith. Just simply believing that Jesus is Lord. And I invite you into my life. So if that's you, I invite you to come up after the service, after we dismiss. Let one of our prayer couples, Billy, if you could come up, and Linda, if you could come up. Let one of our prayer couples lead you in the prayer of salvation so you can get in on the finished works of Jesus and get in covenant with him because we want to see you there in heaven. And we also want to see you doing what he's called you to do here right now. Amen? Amen? Well, our pastor always speaks the blessing over us before we dismiss. We know that you're the head, not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're blessed coming in. You're blessed going out. Everything you set your hands to. You're the lender not to borrow. You're good looking and you're dismissed. I might have missed one. Love you guys. Thank you. It's like the Lord and all the earth. 
match this love beauty endless worth nothing in this world will satisfy Jesus you're the cup that won't run dry your presence is heaven to me Treasure of my heart and of my soul In my weakness you are merciful Redeemer of my past and present wrongs Holder of my future days to come Your presence is here 